James chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which as of you kept back by fraud is crying. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. He cares for you and maybe... uh, The Lord laid this particular message on my heart today because we're going to camp, and we need patience. We need long-suffering, don't we? We need to endure. And James, the human instrument in recording these God-breathed words, he was the half-brother of Jesus. Half-brother because God the Holy Spirit created the physical body of Jesus strictly through the seed of the woman, not of any man. In fact, in Genesis 3, God told Eve that through her seed, the serpent's head would be crushed. God told Satan when he had taken the form of a serpent and and had deceived them, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel." That's a reference to the pain and the agony that would be inflicted upon Jesus. But through that, the serpent's head would be crushed, would be killed. The seed, the product of woman, would crush the product of Satan. God took on flesh through the seed of woman to take on the seed of Satan, to take on the seed of Satan as an enemy and to take on sin. He took what had ensnared all of mankind and took it captive, as Ephesians 4.8 tells us. He took captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He presented us with the opportunity to be what God calls us to be. As you know, Adam was given authority, dominion, and we were in him. And Adam took that God-given authority over all of mankind and he rebelled and he sinned. And God in righteousness departed from Adam and from all of us who were in Adam. And hence you and I were the product of that rebellion. But Jesus provided the opportunity as the seed of the woman to give mankind a reset. Eve herself was drawn from Adam before the fall, and by God using that seed, He created Jesus out from under the dominion of Adam and out from under His sin. Jesus was born out from under the victory that Satan had won over mankind. Jesus was born out from under the victory that Satan had won over mankind. Jesus was truly man in the flesh, but not a part of Adam's rebellion in the flesh. Uh, We've heard it at Christmas, haven't we? And it's vital to our real salvation in Christ. 
Matthew 1, beginning of verse 20, says, But while he thought, while Joseph thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And through Adam's sin, we said, God, we want to be our own God. And through Christ, we can say, No, I want you to be God, Lord. And then Joseph, being raised from sleep, still in Matthew 1, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife, and listen, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called him his name Jesus. Now, now the Bible is telling us they didn't have normal marital relations until after Jesus was born. But they did after that. You can be sure. Did you hear it? Joseph did not know Mary until she brought forth her firstborn son. Mary and Joseph had natural children after Jesus was born, and James was one of them. He's the instrument that God is using to speak these words that we just read. And James, as that brother of Jesus, had a hard time with his brother being the Messiah. I can only imagine. <laughs> Being the younger of three boys, thankfully the girl came along finally, my sister who's here today. I'm glad she's here. And James, as that brother of Jesus, had that, had that hard time. And James started, as we all do, locked in the sin of Adam and in his own sinning apart from God. He started just like everybody else. In Matthew 13, beginning of verse 54, it records his unbelief. And when he was coming to his own country, Jesus taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Where did this wisdom come from? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is, is not his mother Mary and his brothers or James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, aren't they here? Whence then hath this man all these things? They were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. Some of us can relate to that too. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But he was changed, wasn't he? By hearing and by believing the gospel. Changed by Emmanuel, by the virgin-born Son of God, come to be with us. We had told Him to leave by our own sinning and our sin, but now He came to be with us through Christ. The God with us became the God in James. And James became a church leader in Jerusalem, and God used him to pen these words here in James. And notice what James says in verse 1. Not James, a brother of Jesus, but James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus was his earthly, physical brother, but that's not what he focused on. He's my Lord, he said. What a transformation. From my brother can't be the Messiah to he is the Lord, he is Lord, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated servant means a voluntary slave, one who gives himself up to another's will, devoted to another to disregard, to the disregard of one's own interest. That's what the word servant means. I give myself and my will to him. He's my guide. He's my leader now. I am a servant of Christ, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And James called Jesus Lord, owner, leader, director, God, the one willfully given his ownership, supreme in authority. And God uses James to talk about the horrible regret 
for those who have any other God. If you have any other God, that is going to eat you alive in future eternity. It's going to eat you alive at judgment day if you have any other God than Him. If it's popularity, if it's status, if it's wealth, if it's physical pleasure, whatever you choose over the clear will of God, James presents the dreadful, sickening thought of another God besides Jesus. We can read it again in James 5 if you haven't closed your Bible. Verse 1, Go to now, you rich men, those who put riches first. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches, they're corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. All those fancy clothes and and, uh, name brands that you're wearing, they're worthless. Your gold and your silver is cankered. The rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Because you chose the wrong God. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the labors, those people you've cheated, they're crying now. And God has heard. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Wanton means you've allowed the flesh what feels good to rule you. You're piling up such horrible regret for eternity. And I can't imagine to think that those things are better than the Lord Jesus Christ. There's coming a day very, very soon where there will be great regret that grips the heart of every human that has had another God other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You have condemned and killed the just, he says, and they don't even resist you. You're getting away with it right now. You're getting away with it, verse 6 says. But then God has James turned to those who by God's grace, the grace that expressed and provided the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Those who have turned from their false gods unto the living God, the virgin-born Son of God with the remedy of Emmanuel, God with us. And he says, be patient, brethren. Be patient, brethren. Verse 7, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Be patient, abide faithful, because God is not through with you yet. God has not accomplished what he's accomplishing yet. He needed you to begin. He needs you to finish. He needs you to mature. He's waiting. That early rain when life first sprang forth oh, was glorious and it's wonderful. And if you're a gardener, it's kind of nice when you see those seeds are really coming forth and you've cared for them and you've watered them and life has come. And he says, the Lord is patient. He needs the early rain, but he also needs the latter rain. He needs to be Emmanuel. He needs to be God with you. Endure, he says. Establish your hearts, he says in verse 8. Be ye patient. God's patient. Establish your hearts. Ground your hearts. Grow in the word. Grow in the faith. Endure. Don't turn back. As Galatians 4, 9 says, to the beggarly element. Don't turn back to the beggarly elements. Don't turn back to the poverty of your old ways, that worldly system of false gods. Don't turn against or grudge your brethren. Don't grieve the brethren by turning from the Lord back to the flesh. Verse 10, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Endure. Endure. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have endured suffering and have been patient. Behold, we count them happy which endure. That word happy is uh, not the same in today's English, is it? We count them blessed. They are in the most uh, blessed, highest position a man could be in. 
When God says, woe unto you, that's the worst position you could ever be in. Woe unto you. Blessed, you're in the best position you could be in from God's viewpoint. Behold, we count them blessed which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and seen the end of the Lord. The Lord is full of pity and tender mercy. He cares and He can help us to endure. To stay under is what that word means. Stay under the power of the Word of God. Some, another quote from my dear old dad, he used to say, people need to be under the Word. They need to be under the Word. God is so good, so full of pity, of extreme compassion. We serve a God who's getting rid of sin once and forever, and when it's gone, it'll never come again. He calls you to be a part of that process and be on the positive side like Job was. He doesn't want the riches of the world to burn you. He doesn't want you to burn with regret because you chose the wrong thing. Be like Job in Job 23.10. Listen to what he said. He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Ladies retreat, right? (laughs) He knows the way that I take. When he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job had a lot to learn. But he was in the process of Jesus as Lord. He was in the process of God as Lord through that Redeemer that Job spoke of that for him was yet future. He was letting him be Lord. He endured. He continued. He was abiding Uh, He avoided eternity's greatest regrets. The perseverance of the saints. It's not optional as far as heaven is concerned, but it's not automatic. You must allow Him to be the Lord of your life. You must allow Him to be the Lord of your life by your own free will and stand with the Apostle Paul as he stood with Jesus in 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not endure. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelists. Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, he said to Timothy. And the time of my departure is at hand. Listen to him. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, because of that, because I've finished the course, because I've kept the faith, There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I want to see him. I love his appearing. Now, and when he comes visibly, I love to see him. The reward of endurance, the crown of righteousness, the life with God forever that true holiness grants, provides. Listen to the words of our Lord Jesus in Revelation 3, beginning with verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I hear pages turning. Y'all want to turn there? Revelation 3.10. We shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take your crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Those who endure. 
I will put a new name on them. And I know one thing that we'll be as citizens of that new Jerusalem. We'll have our citizenship in that new kingdom. New name? How about dakimas? The Greek word, dakimas. Means tried and found faithful. Tried and found faithful. James 1.12, blessed is the man that endureth. Temptation. For when he is tried, and the Greek word means whenever he has been tested and found acceptable, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man that endureth. Temptation. For when he is tried, whenever he has been tested and found faithful, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to everyone who loves him. The crown of life, what is that? It's being with God forever, isn't it? Tested, tried, endured, finished, coming forth as gold, simply by putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply by letting him be Lord of your life. Nothing difficult about it because His grace is sufficient. It is a faithful, abiding, loving, merciful relationship with God. I want us to sing, Gene.